Okay, right. Well, Boris Johnson has um, cancelled uh, Christmas, uh, but not ours. Um, we use this meeting to um, re-examine uh, Jesus. I think it, we should begin, I, I suppose, by pointing out uh, what most people do know on the left or ought to know on the left. Uh, and that's what Oliver Cromwell uh, knew, who was really in the business of uh, cancelling uh, Christmas. Um, you know, he knew his uh, Bible. He knew his um, history uh, to some degree. And uh, he, he considered Christmas to be a uh, papish uh, invention and a direct borrowing from uh, the heathens. And of course, that's absolutely true, uh, that uh, Christmas uh, wasn't when Jesus was born. Um, the Orthodox Church has a different date. We know when they chose the date um, historically in the Roman Empire. And um, we also know that it was sort of mapped onto uh, the Roman Saturnalia. Uh, in other words, it was uh, the Christian church adopting um, the sort of calendar of uh, northern people, um, you know, for which uh, midsummer uh, or midwinter, uh, you know, when things have got as dark as they can get, when we all have a, a, a celebration, we all have a, a big party. So this was the uh, uh, Christian church um, imposing its uh, religion in that sense or celebration of its religion um, onto a pre-existing Roman and for that matter pre-Roman um, uh, calendar and that's no reason uh, why um, we want to um, uh, cancel Christmas or anything else uh, of uh, that nature. Okay having said that I think that uh, uh, it will be uh, a good idea uh, to just very briefly map out uh, the um, Judea um, of the time that we think Jesus uh, lived. Um, I'm not using the date naught um, AD. We don't know when he was uh, actually born. We don't know when he died, but if I use that rough time zone, uh, you'll get what I mean. So the first thing I think to understand is that the um, Judea uh, at the time of uh, Jesus, it was viewed by um, um, ordinary people as um, a period of humiliation. Uh, Judea had been conquered and conquered and conquered again. Um, you can look at the Bible. We're talking about the Old Testament and the Persians, the Assyrians, um, the Neo-Babylonians. Um, historically, we know uh, that the Persian Empire was replaced by the Macedonian Empire with Alexander the Great and how his generals divided uh, that empire. But we also know uh, that with the rise of Rome, uh, it extended, first of all, its hegemony uh, to Judea. Uh, and eventually put Judea under direct uh, Roman uh, rule. Um, now, if we look at the um, history of this part of the world, we also know that if there's a crisis going on uh, somewhere, um, that uh, uh, often um, Judean leaders would use that as an opportunity to gain independence, uh, we know uh, that that independence was often pretty formal. Um, nonetheless, in uh, 164 um, BC, um, a Jewish army uh, defeated a Macedonian army. This is under uh, Judas Maccabee and uh, briefly uh, gained um, um, independence. Uh, we know uh, that... Um, in terms of um, when the Romans um, asserted their um, hegemony um, and uh, then started to extend it to direct rule, uh, that this actually provoked um, a whole series of um, uh, uprisings um, in uh, Judea. Um, 
we know the date um, of this um, um, uprising. And what is interesting for our, for our later story is this is associated with um, a census. Uh, so the Romans um, extend their hegemony, they assert their rule in uh, uh, Judea, and they, they um, uh, carry out a, um, a census uh, of their population. Now it needs to be understood uh, that the census in those days was not designed to look at future education needs. Um, how do we provide a, a health service? Uh, this is very similar in that sense to the doomsday book of uh, William the First. This is about my, my real estate and how much tax revenue uh, I can uh, uh, get uh, for it. So we know that that caused discontent um, we know that there were uh, more than just civil disturbances uh, associated uh, with that particular um, um, imposition. Kortsky, Karl Kortsky in his book, and I definitely recommend it, uh, The Foundations of Christianity, talks about uh, the Jews, the Judeans uh, of this uh, uh, period having a, a fanatical uh, nationalism. Um, that we're talking about a, a, a people that had a consciousness uh, of themselves. This is not just because of where they live and what language they spoke, but they were united uh, by a particular religion uh, that was pretty much uh, unique to them. Um, uh, so they had a cohesion um, that might not have been seen um, in other parts uh, of the Roman uh, Empire. And it would appear to be uh, the case that uh, the Romans had um, a constant trouble uh, with their uh, Judean uh, province. We shouldn't exaggerate that because, uh, quite frankly, there are uprisings, um, you know, throughout the history of the of the Roman Empire, not least by uh, Roman generals themselves seeing their opportunity uh, to actually uh, gain power in Rome um, itself. Okay, so. In terms of the bigger story, I just think it might be worthwhile um, stressing uh, that um, far from the this this religion uh, being an ancient religion, you know, going back uh, to Adam or going back to Noah or something of uh, that nature, the religion um, that was being practiced, if we use the word AD naught, you know what I mean, the religion that was being practiced then was relatively new and it had been brought back actually from Babylon uh, by Persian satraps, Jewish Persian satraps who developed the religion that we would recognize in the Bible there. So this is, is not a product of Judean society itself. It's something that's, that was wrapped up um, uh, in um, the Persians uh, imposing their rule um, on Judea using um, uh, agents uh, that they brought um, from uh, Babylon, uh, which they took over when they overthrew the Babylonian um, empire. Now, and what's interesting about that is if you look at the Bible accounts um, of that, um, the writers of the Bible talk about the people of the land, uh, the people that they encounter uh, when they go uh, to Judea and how these people are worshipping false gods uh, and how uh, they impose on these peoples uh, the purity cults that they have developed uh, in, in Babylonia. So what I would argue, and again, I've tried to look in uh, to this question and I haven't got any particularly satisfactory uh, answers, but what appears to have happened is that this religion of the elite seems to have been internalized by what I'll call the people of the land, the ordinary uh, uh, people. And in that sense, this religion was then turned against the elite, a religion that was uh, imposing a sort of apartheid system um, that uh, benefited the elite uh, was then turned by ordinary people against the elite itself. So if we look at the history that I've just described, uh, with each uh, uh, wave of invaders uh, that came, the elite tended to adapt themselves 
to these invaders. So if we look at uh, King Harold and um, um, his uh, um, royal family and the, the, their hangers on, uh, these people were imported by the Romans from the south. Uh, they were semi-Jewish, but what is crucial about them is that, the, that these people, how should we put it, uh, mixed with foreigners. Uh, they mix with Romans. Um, uh, the elite in that society uh, went to the gymnasium. Uh, it participated in, how should we put it, Greek uh, culture. So although it's uh, the Romans taking over, uh, this is the Romans taking over uh, uh, um, a society that speaks Greek in terms of the elite uh, of the population. Now, in um, um, a book by a guy called Jose Josephus, um, you can read, definitely worthwhile reading. There's two books in particular that I'll be basing myself on. Uh, and one is called The Jewish Wars, and the other one is The Jewish Antiquities. Uh, some of it just goes way back to Adam, and um, I wouldn't particularly recommend you reading that. But what is significant about this guy, although he's called Je Josephus, uh, he was actually a Judean aristocrat. He was Jewish. Uh, he was proudly Jewish. Um, and what he's doing, he's writing these two books, I would guess, uh, for a Roman um, um, audience. And uh, what is significant about him is that one, he's writing not only about ancient history and Adam and Noah and all that sort of stuff, he's writing about events that he had firsthand experience of. Um, so here's someone writing about Jewish history almost as a journalist. Okay, a pro-Roman uh, journalist, but nevertheless, someone who identifies themselves as being Jewish, someone who was, um, how should you put it, a participant um, in the events that we're going to do going to describe. Okay, so when it comes to politics, um, he describes what he calls three philosophies or three parties. Uh, this shouldn't be taken um, in our modern sense of a political party. Um, it should be thought of as something uh, much, much broader. Anyway, he describes three parties in terms of uh, um, Jewish thought, and this is not including, and this needs to be understood, the Herodians, the, the royal uh, court and its hangers on. So below them, you've got the Sadducees. Um, this is a conservative uh, school of thought. On the other hand, it's also a school of thought that doesn't believe in predestination, doesn't believe in angels, uh, believes that, well, we might not like the Romans, uh, but who are we? Uh, we can't overthrow the, the Romans, so we're going to have to learn uh, to live with them. Should be pointed out uh, in terms of the priests, that um, in terms of the temple, the so-called second temple, it was in reality the first uh, temple, that there were something like 1,500 uh, priests that were meant to get tithes uh, from the ordinary people uh, to support them. The reality was at this time, uh, that the chief uh, uh, priest um, grabbed hold uh, of uh, most of uh, that wealth and used it uh, to support their own uh, lifestyle, but also to buy themselves um, a constituency. Either way, um, if you take the Sadducees, you could call them uh, the party of uh, the high priest. You could, you could call them uh, the party of uh, the priesthood. Uh, at, a, at a stretch. Okay, now below them, um, what you've got is, as anyone who knows uh, the Bible will um, recognize, you've got the Pharisees. If you read uh, Kortsky, if you read Hyman Maccabee, a uh, very good uh, writer on this, um, this question, um, they betray the, betray the, um, portray the, um, the Pharisees as the popular uh, party, uh, that the, these people um, are, are the ones that uh, are against the high priests. So for Hyman Maccabee, for example, um, he looks at the Bible uh, and he sees an inversion. Um, he thinks that, uh, you know, when Jesus is condemning uh, 
the Pharisees. This is a later over overwrite uh, that this is untrue, um, uh, and that uh, uh, you know the Christian religion um, is doing the Pharisees uh, a disservice. Um, in terms of my own reading um, on the question, I have to say uh, that that was my original take uh, on the Pharisees. Uh, but then I read uh, several books by uh, a, an American guy called Robert Eisenman. Um, I don't know if any of you know uh, Robert Eisenman. Um, if you're old enough, uh, you, you might remember the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, this was in the 60s from my memory. I haven't got it written down uh, in terms of a note. But that, that's, that's my memory um, uh, of it. And it was some sort of, um, I don't know, young herder boy um, went into a cave and discovered um, uh, these scrolls, some of which were on metal, um, some of them on um, parchment. Either way, Robert Eisenman was one of the translators of um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and he was responsible, um, along with some other translators, for actually releasing this uh, to the public. Uh, that the Catholic Church, I think, sat on the Dead Sea Scrolls for something like 20, 25 years, um, and then it, it was the translators that rebelled. And at the time, um, this story in the popular press, and I'm talking about the Sunday Times, the Sunday Telegraph, that sort of popular press, was here's the real Jesus, um, you know, because his stuff that was written at the time of Jesus and, and these scrolls describe a Messiah figure. Uh, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls describe two Messiahs. One would take part, take charge of the war party. Uh, the other Messiah would take charge of the religious side of things. Either way, um, um, this was considered, uh, uh, you know, um, a literary uh, sensation, and it was a literary uh, sensation. And therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting um, uh, Eisenman uh, simply because I'm taking him seriously as a historian um, um, of this period. And what he says is, no, uh, the Pharisees were basically uh, what they are portrayed as um, in the Bible. Uh, the Bible isn't um, inaccurate. He says, if you actually look at the historical record, there are so many examples that we know of, of the Pharisees doing deals uh, uh, with the Romans, doing deals uh, with the elite, betraying um, 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 the ordinary people, that this doesn't work uh, for him. So for him, um, the, the Pharisees are uh, disputers over uh, the minutiae uh, of the religious law. Uh, they are nitpickers, but also, yes, they should be understood as uh, uh, popular uh, teachers uh, and as interpreters um, of the holy book. What we need to understand is that for the temple elite, uh, when they came back from Babylon, uh, they attempted to uh, update uh, the holy books as far as they were concerned that would suit their purposes and then freeze prof prophecy. So once you had uh, their Old Testament uh, in place, that was going to be it. And the role of the high priest, the role of the priesthood in Jerusalem, and they concentrated the religion into that one uh, single uh, spot, was simply to preside over ritual. Um, and to uphold uh, the ritual. Well, life moves on, uh, as we know. And in terms of ordinary people, yeah, they relied on uh, the Pharisees who could read you uh, the text, but also could take it upon themselves to interpret um, uh, the text. So we'll leave, up, uh, uh, leave it open at the moment of whether or not they are the popular party um, as Kortsky. Uh, believed that they were. Okay, there's a third philosophy uh, that Josephus uh, uh, deals with. Um, this is something that appears to be uh, from first-hand uh, experience, and this is the so-called uh, Essenes. Um, he would appear to have been an initiate and lived um, in an, an Essene uh, community uh, for a year. 
And one presumes that in terms of his writing, it's not just a question that he had first-hand experience of it. One presumes uh, that in terms of his audience, uh, that the, the Roman audience would find this amusing, interesting, fascinating. So he describes the Essenes as perfect communists. Uh, he describes them as living in isolated uh, communities. He describes them as being obsessed with praying. So X times a day uh, they pray, but before they pray, uh, they cleanse themselves. So before God, they have to be clean. He even chuckles, which would, um, you know, from our point of view, uh, seem sort of somewhat bizarre, that every time they go and have a poo, uh, believe it or not, uh, they actually wash themselves. Um, even though he says uh, that, uh, you know, having a poo, I'm using my words, by the way, of course, uh, is perfectly natural. Um, so he, he basically saying uh, that these people are so obsessed with spiritual cleanliness, um, even when they go and have a poo, uh, they have to, in effect, do it in front of uh, a God. In terms of their communism, um, he describes them as um, bringing everything that you've got in terms of your wealth. If you join this community, you have to bring 100% of your wealth and you have to give 100% of it uh, uh, to uh, the community. They also appear to be um, in a situation of where they elect their leader um, and also have a, um, an annual uh, review of membership. If you're not up for it, uh, they'll kick you out. What was the philosophy um, um, of these people? Well, I'm not saying they're the same, uh, but they are strikingly similar. If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which are extensive um, uh, documents, albeit often frustratingly uh, fragmented, what you get is basically the idea uh, that these people were looking towards some sort of apocalyptic liberation from the Romans. The Romans, we would believe, uh, in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls are called the Kittim. Um, that these people and everyone who collaborates with them uh, will be done and, and they're going to be destroyed um, in one hell of a, a battle. And what our job uh, is to do is to purify ourselves and win as many uh, of the children of Israel to join our army uh, as possible. But we're not going to rely on a straightforward military uh, confrontation with the Romans and their Quislings. We're going to rely um, on God sending uh, legions of angels uh, to help us um, in the final battle. Hence, uh, you have uh, the organization of these communities into hundreds, into battle units. Now, how real that is, that's a different question. Um, you know, um, how many we're talking about, I, I haven't got a clue. We can look at the ruins of uh, some of their communities, um, but how many uh, were actually involved at that level, uh, that's another question. So, we might be dealing uh, with the imagination, but even if we are just dealing with the imagination, I think it gives you an insight into the thought world um, of this particular uh, party. So in other words, uh, uh, Josephus is describing three parties. He's describing the party of the conservatives, the high priests, uh, the rich, um, who aren't um, uh, members of the, the royal house, uh, but are attached to the uh, temple and preserving the temple cult. Uh, then you've got the middle ground, uh, the middle classes, to use a modern uh, a term, um, which would be the uh, Pharisees. And then you've got these apocalyptic revolutionaries uh, such as the Essenes. And if you look at Josephus, what's interesting there is having said that there are three parties, then starts to talk about a fourth party, a fourth philosophy. Um, he begins in terms of his description of them, full of um, um, hostility. He describes them as bandits, as no goods, uh, false prophets. Uh, he, he gives various names 
uh, to people. So there's some false prophet that led people towards uh, Egypt and how troops had to be sent out uh, after them. Uh, he describes false prophets uh, leading people astray. He describes false prophets uh, as uh, preaching class war against fit and proper people such as um, himself. But he also uh, touches upon um, um, history that we know of. Uh, I've already referred to the civil disturbances of AD 6. Um, and what seems to have happened in AD 6 is that um, the um, zealot guerrilla fighter, um, I think it was uh, Judas up in Galilee, uh, unites with um, um, some sort of religious figure um, in Jerusalem to form what we would be calling now and they called then um, zealots. Um, in terms of various names, um, most of these religious um, organizations called themselves a huge variety uh, of uh, different names, but you could get a general idea uh, of what they meant uh, by themselves. You know, zealot would mean zealot, being a zealot in the cause of uh, God. Um, some zealots um, were Republican, some of them uh, were uh, monarchists, but they would also describe themselves as things like um, the party of the poor. Um, so these people are looking uh, downwards, uh, they're not looking upwards um, in society. Either way, um, what you get is, uh, yeah, guerrilla organizations uh, formed, but also um, something that had an impact in um, Jerusalem, again, not to the liking of Josephus, is this organization. Again, we know very little about them, um, although you can read, uh, um, you know, references to them, the Sicarii. Um, who would uh, assassinate um, collaborators with Rome, assassinate uh, members of the Sadducee uh, uh, party. Um, okay, so in terms of um, um, Eisenman, he basically is saying uh, that if you take this fourth philosophy, uh, that's your popular uh, party. Um, that um, in terms of Josephus, his description is very rough and ready. It's not uh, a detailed uh, description, but it's certainly uh, there. Um, uh, and the reason why I think we are pretty safe uh, in calling it uh, a people's party uh, is in terms of subsequent uh, history, uh, which I'll come to um, um, in a minute. Okay. Okay, so if we look at that background, let's just sketch it out again. Um, Jewish people in AD naught uh, didn't like being taxed by the Romans. Uh, they didn't like being ruled by the Romans. Uh, they didn't like the Sadducee uh, high priests. Uh, they wanted some sort of uh, liberation. Uh, they wanted some sort of um, uh, fight back. I think we can say that. Okay, so then we turn uh, at last to uh, uh, Jesus. And against that background, what we've got and what we're meant to believe in terms of the, the biblical account is that Jesus proves very popular. Uh, you know, when he sets out on his mission, he's very quickly performing miracles. He's very quickly gathering around him, not only disciples, uh, but thousands and thousands uh, of um, uh, followers. Okay, so what's the message? What's the biblical message uh, of Jesus? Well, things like uh, resist not evil, um, pay your taxes, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, uh, he mixes um, um, with um, um, Romans, uh, he mixes. Uh, with prostitutes. Uh, his first miracle um, is an interesting one, um, turning water um, into wine. Um, the reason I say that's um, um, interesting is because although we actually don't have, and I'll elaborate on this, although we actually don't have any contemporary 
references to Jesus whatsoever. We do have references uh, to what is described in the Bible as the brother of the Lord. So we do have historical evidence of a guy called James. Um, we know he existed. He appears in um, uh, Josephus. He's, he's dead um, by the time that Josephus gets into military action, but he, he's remembered. And what he's remembered for is being called James the Just. James the Just, who prayed so much that he got uh, calluses on his knees. James the Just, who wore the same white uh, cloak until it uh, turned to rags. James the Just, who led the party of uh, um, what I'll call the Nazarenes for the moment in Jerusalem, amongst whose rules were uh, non-consumption of alcohol, uh, but also a prohibition on mixing with foreigners. So this Jesus, um, who, would, we, who, is his, who is the brother uh, of James, behaves in a very strange way. Um, if, he, if, 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 if these two have any similarity, and you would presume that they do, it's very strange that Jesus' first miracle is to turn water, which is what James would have drunk, or maybe fruit juice, uh, into alcoholic, uh, um, um, you know, wine, <laughs> simple as uh, that, in the same way, uh, in terms of who's the first to recognize, uh, you know, um, Jesus as the Messiah, um, um, who's a Gentile, it's a Roman uh, centurion, um, who says uh, that Jesus shouldn't be uh, killed, it's the Roman governor, it's the Jewish people collectively, uh, who demand his death. Okay, so just as a, a guy who gets a popular uh, following, it, it's very hard to work out um, how someone who's urging people um, not to resist evil, who's urging people to pay their taxes, actually gains a mass following and is greeted uh, when he comes in uh, to Jerusalem uh, with the words, um, you know, Hosanna, uh, save us, save us, uh, liberate us. How do we put that uh, together? It, it does seem to me at least uh, to be something very strange. To me, it would be the equivalent if Tommy Sheridan had got up uh, in the middle of the poll tax campaign in Glasgow and had shouted out, pay your poll tax, don't resist uh, Thatcher. Well, you could, do, you could do that in Glasgow, sure. Uh, but one thing I would be convinced of under those circumstances is you would not get a mass following. People would not follow a Tommy Sheridan who was saying, don't resist Thatcher, pay the poll tax. No one would join his uh, party. No one would join um, his demonstration. He would just come over uh, as a crazy um, Scottish Tory. Uh, it would be as simple as that. It wouldn't make any uh, impact. Uh, in terms of popular consciousness, this would not be something uh, that lasts in any way uh, in terms of history. And then we've got the rest of uh, the Bible account. And yeah, as we're talking about Christmas, let's think about the uh, account uh, of Jesus's uh, birth. I've already mentioned uh, the census, which we know about, AD 6. So, okay, uh, so the, the writers of the Bible knew that. So what we have is this story that a Roman census requires every male uh, to go back to their hometown, right? Which is a really weird one, isn't it? Now that might be no problem uh, for most peasants in the first century. I can well believe that in terms of your average Jude Judean uh, peasant, you know, granddad was born there, father was born there, great, great, great grandfather was born there, or mother, doesn't matter, uh, no problem. But what we've got in the Bible is this idea uh, that Joseph and the heavily pregnant Mary have to travel all the way down from Galilee, uh, which is in the north, far north uh, of the country, indeed in a different province, they have to travel all the way down uh, to the little town of Bethlehem. Uh, 
uh, well, one, we know that that wasn't true, uh, i.e. that Roman censuses did not require uh, people to travel uh, to the town of their birth or the town of their father's birth or town of their mother's birth. So again, we need to be asking ourselves, what's this all about? Why would they write such a thing? Well, I put this forward uh, to you, that in terms of the historic and remembered um, last famous king um, of Judea, uh, what we've got is the story of Solomon building the temple, which is a fabrication. But what we've got is, is um, Solomon's father, uh, David. And um, where was his royal seat? It was Bethlehem, right? So, so these, these people uh, who are writing the Bible are trying to establish something. And what's interesting in, in that context is if you look at your New Testament, um, I think it's Mark and um, Luke, not quite sure, might have got it noted down. Either way, what we've got is two testaments of the new, um, um, two books of the New Testament uh, that actually um, trace Joseph's um, father, grandfather, all the way back to David, and then all the way back to Adam, right? The fact that they've got uh, different lineages is not really the point. So we're not dealing with historic reality uh, that Joseph, whoever the hell he was, uh, is actually related to King David. What we're dealing with is people who are telling his story, Jesus's story, are trying to do that job. And therefore, once we start to see it that way, then we have to start thinking uh, about um, slogans uh, that crowds were shouting out. So if you again go back to the Bible, when Jesus comes in to Jerusalem, they are calling Jesus son of David. Son of David. Now, in terms of Jesus of the Bible, he's constantly having to explain uh, to his uh, disciples and the common people. No, when I mean king, I don't mean king. Um, I don't mean, um, I've got no family. Um, no, um, this, it, this, my kingdom is not of this earth. Well, what I would suggest is that the common people um, of Jerusalem at the time and uh, other, other parts of Judea actually meant what they said and that Jesus's um, first um, propagandists were making exactly that claim. Now, if we wanna look back in terms of English history, uh, I would argue uh, that we're not dealing with fact here, uh, we're dealing with uh, a propaganda and we're dealing with a propaganda of the sort that would lead some peasant leader or maybe not, maybe even an aristocrat in who is an Anglo-Saxon under uh, Norman rule uh, to declare themselves the legitimate king of England as compared with these uh, upstarts that have invaded and taken away our liberties, these Norman uh, conquerors, these, these foreigners. Uh, I am uh, the real king of England and uh, if, I, if I occupy the throne, I'm gonna restore your liberty. Excuse me, my um, door is going. Could you ring another bell, please? Okay, just to... Sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm arguing uh, that Jesus did mean it, his um, um, disciples meant it, and the common people also meant it. Ditto, we need to um, look uh, at why um, they are saying that uh, it's Joseph. Well, again, what I would suggest is that um, in terms of the Bible story, we see it as being incredibly plastic. Um, so you've got in the Bible at the same time as giving you a family tree of Jesus going all the way back uh, to David, is you've got the claim uh, that of course, uh, Mary and Joseph uh, never had sexual intercourse, uh, that Jesus was um, um, conceived uh, through a virgin uh, birth and therefore, 
uh, what you've got is the role of uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, not Jesus uh, involved. And when uh, Jesus said, I am the son of God, uh, he meant it. Well, I would argue on the contrary, uh, he didn't mean that. And if he had have, if he had made that claim, that would be completely alien to the thought world of the people he lived amongst. It would be something that Alexander the Great could claim. It's something that a Roman emperor uh, could claim. But in terms of a popular uh, leader in the first century Judea, if you made that claim, one people will either look at look upon you as uh, mad or they would look upon you as a blasphemer and would have stoned you. Uh, instead of stoning uh, Jesus, he found himself uh, a popular uh, following. So if we look at the names of um, uh, parties uh, that I've referred to, another one of their names um, is Sons of God. Uh, and they definitely did not mean uh, that they were the sort of biological or, 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 or anything of uh, that sort, the product uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what they're talking about is uh, a religious uh, party political uh, designation. What else do we have um, in terms of the Jesus story? Uh, well, he gets to um, Bethlehem. That suits uh, the story. So he's born in um, Bethlehem, the royal seat of uh, King uh, David. Um, sure, uh, late in later accounts, he's born of a virgin mother, but from his early point of view, it matters. Joseph is related uh, to David. And what happens then is that um, loads of wise men uh, come and uh, give him uh, gifts. Um, and on their way uh, to deliver all these uh, fabulous gifts to the new king um, of Israel, is the um, king, in, king in Jerusalem says, oh, Jesus Christ, sorry about that, no pun intended. Uh, there's a new king on the block. I've got to get rid of him. Uh, let's kill uh, the firstborn, um, you know, everyone's firstborn. Let's go out and uh, massacre the children. Well, again, there's no evidence um, um, of, of that. Um, but of course, Jesus's uh, parents have been warned by an angel uh, before that, and they escape uh, going towards uh, Jesus. I think all of these things um, um, show all the, I mean, they're very imaginative and it's a great uh, story, uh, but no different fundamentally uh, to the story that Jesus as a 12 year old goes to the temple and out debates uh, the, um, the priests. Uh, this is a, um, a building up uh, the importance uh, of Jesus. Um, not in terms of his ministry, uh, but before um, his ministry. So we've got um, at least two possibilities uh, in front of us, uh, and that is that um, uh, Jesus actually uh, didn't exist, that the whole thing um, is a fiction. And I personally think that that's a, um, an arguable point. It, it's a, a defensible a point. I mean, uh, you can read, you know, good academic books on um, Muhammad and uh, early Islam uh, that claims that the uh, Quran was invented either in Damascus or uh, Baghdad, um, you know, a hundred years after the event. Uh, to me, um, you know, having, <laughs> having looked at the Quran, far from being an invented book, uh, it, it, it to me it's so bloody chaotic um, uh, you know that to me it can't be the work of uh, you know a committee getting together and saying hey let's invent ourselves uh, a religion i.e the conquerors of the uh, Roman and um, Persian Empire suddenly find themselves ruling huge territories and they say well we need a, a religion go away and invent it you know uh, if you're going to invent a religion you wouldn't have invented a religion with the Quran, um, far too illogical, far too um, chaotic um, in terms of its uh, uh, message. Uh, it's true, as I've said before, that when it comes to Jesus, we've got no contemporary um, references to this man, even though he carries out all these miracles, um, even though he rose from the dead, um, uh, even though uh, it roused uh, uh, the masses 
uh, of uh, the country, uh, no contemporary uh, records whatsoever. And therefore I come uh, to Josephus, because of course, everyone knows who knows anything about Josephus is that you do actually have passages in Josephus uh, that talk about our Lord, talk about uh, Jesus being the Christ. It also talks interestingly, uh, and this maybe sort of preempts my story a little later on, um, about Jerusalem falling and being sacked as sort of God's revenge uh, for the killing of James, the brother of um, our Lord, the Christ, or who is called. Uh, way back to Voltaire, um, intellectuals were going, this has to be a load of cod, this has to be bogus, there's no way Josephus uh, would be talking about this guy called Jesus in those terms, this has to be made up. And that's the general consensus uh, nowadays. Now you can either say that that was done um, with good intentions or bad, you make up your own mind. It could have been, um, you know, a scribe writing out Josephus in some sort of bloody freezing uh, monastery somewhere and saying, well, look, Josephus, this, this eyewitness uh, to all these events, um, couldn't but have helped to notice uh, our Lord so I'm going to insert him. I'm going to correct Josephus because clearly this is a mistake. Or the other one would be, bloody hell, there's this Josephus guy. He doesn't mention the Lord. Well, we're jolly well going to make sure that he does. And so for hundreds of years, in terms of the Catholic Church, Josephus was almost rated as the equivalent of a, a, a fifth testament. Uh, that here is not only a follower of Jesus telling you the Jesus story, here's a pro-Roman Jew, roughly of the same time as Jesus, uh, mentioning Jesus. So it must be right. Go away and read that. Um, here's the story of Jesus. Here's the story of the Jesus party. But as I said, uh, nowadays, all serious scholarship will tell you uh, that this um, is a forgery. Um, so... Um, did Jesus exist or not? Well, I've, I've already argued, well, it's open to question. It's a perfectly valid question. But I would simply say, well, look, if Josephus wrote about uh, uh, James, chances are, uh, James, the brother of, uh, the chances are uh, that also uh, the brother uh, uh, did exist. Uh, either way, uh, we do know uh, that... Um, uh, the James party um, um, impacted uh, upon uh, the society of his day. And we do know um, that the role of, um, um, how should I put it, um, the, the Jesus party, we know that the, the role that it played in terms of Judean life uh, in the first century. Either way, um, the point would be uh, I would uh, argue is that if we know um, the um, uh, James party, uh, then we can get perhaps an idea of um, Jesus. Now, what I'm going to say now uh, is um, some deduction and some uh, inference. It's, it's not the truth. We'll doubtless never know uh, the truth. But if you look at uh, Jesus and you try to place um, an individual um, who's a mass leader in the time that we've described, in the thought world that we, we've described, you can then perhaps trace out a probable account of his um, life um, after he went from being a rabbi, a teacher, to being a prophet, and then a prophet who thought he was going to be the final prophet, and indeed the king prophet. He was going to combine uh, the two functions of being both the um, prophet of the end of times, uh, but also um, the monarch um, um, who is going to preside over uh, God's uh, new world, which was going to be of this world, it should be emphasized, uh, not in heaven. So the argument would go uh, that Jesus thought himself to have some sort of uh, divine uh, mission, some sort of divine uh, purpose. Uh, 
Um, that purpose grew. If we look at the Bible, again, I'm not saying uh, that's accurate. No one was around taking notes uh, at the time, but we have the story of Jesus asking his disciples, who, who am I? And they reply, you're the Christ. The Christ simply means Messiah, the anointed one. Um, you are the anointed one. Um, so we then have um, the story of um, Jesus going up far north. We don't know where, but at the top of some mountain, it might be Mount Hebron, it might have been uh, some other mountain, of where he was, how should you put it, uh, made other. Uh, the spirit uh, came um, um, into him. Uh, it should be uh, re remembered that in the pre-temple uh, Jewish religion, high places were holy. I had many different priests, many different cults, and each high place would be associated with a particular god. And uh, uh, that sense of holiness uh, was clearly around at the time uh, of Jesus. So Jesus and his closest disciples, um, who is it? Um, let me get it right. Well, I haven't got who it is. I've got it later. Uh, either way, yeah, it's um, Peter, James and John. Who knows who the real names are? Um, either way, three disciples uh, go up with him. He's changed into another being. Uh, they crown him. And from that moment on, um, he's basically gambling um, on everything. His life is then a gamble. Uh, 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 God will um, come down and help him. Uh, God will liberate uh, Judea and all humanity uh, from the rule of uh, the Romans. So he travels down from the north. Uh, the Bible describes him uh, gaining a huge following as he travels down, crosses um, uh, the Jordan River, goes to Jericho. Uh, he's performing miracles everywhere. Uh, we don't need to believe in miracles, uh, but what you could believe in perhaps perhaps, uh, is that every town had its professional beggars, its professional blind people, some of whom might not have been blind, its professional cripples, some of whom might not have been crippled. I don't know. Either way, uh, people are looking uh, to Jesus, uh, not as a miracle maker, not as someone who's going to cure them, uh, but someone who's going to liberate them. I think that's the uh, crucial question. So, we, we need to be looking at the message, uh, not, um, you know, the window uh, dressing um, of this story. We then have uh, a picture of Jesus uh, and his followers coming into Jerusalem. Again, you could debate what time of year, but one would guess uh, that they're coming into Jerusalem at the time of a big festival. Could be Passover, could be another one. Uh, Jerusalem as the sort of uh, center of the religion um, under this new, um, newly organized religion is hugely important. Uh, you have to, as a Jew, uh, visit Jerusalem, you know, once in your lifetime. It's like uh, the Muslim religion. You're meant to bring uh, gifts for the high priest. You're meant to sacrifice an animal. So we can imagine uh, the city, which is a pretty uh, large city, uh, in terms of the ancient world, nothing like Josephus talks about in terms of being a million population. That's clearly not true. Nonetheless, we're talking about a big city and we're talking about that city being swollen uh, with um, um, pilgrims who, who've come in uh, from the countryside, maybe from near, maybe from further uh, afield. Either way, we're then given a picture of uh, the masses greeting Jesus. He rides on a, on a white ass, fulfilling a prophecy uh, from what we would call in the Christian religion, uh, the Old uh, Testament. Uh, Jesus is coming in on a white ass. Uh, people are throwing down uh, palm leaves um, as he's come. As I've said before, they're crying out, Hosanna. They're crying out, save us. They're crying out, um, you, you're, you're the king, King David, son of uh, God. Um, that's how he's greeted. And he comes through the uh, gate and goes up uh, to the temple. And we're told uh, that uh, in the temple, 
uh, they're able to occupy uh, the temple enclosure and we're told about Jesus driving out the money lenders that's what we've got in the so-called new testament i take that myself uh, to be a story of jesus clearing out the high priests uh, basically telling them uh, to clear out uh, we're told that uh, these people can't resist they've got a temple police force but we're told uh, that so strong uh, are the people so determined are the people that they couldn't do anything about it it would appear in terms of the New Testament, that Jesus and his followers uh, let the life of the temple carry on as normal. So the other priests carried on with their sacrifices and their prayers, uh, but the Jesus party um, was there uh, not only to preach, but to prepare for the final battle. And uh, again, you've got that actually um, in the, the New Testament, that Jesus is there for seven days and seven nights. Uh, you've got the story of the Last Supper and, um, you know, no more, you know, this is the final time I'm going to sit down with you under the present um, global order uh, because big things are happening uh, tomorrow. Um, so if you know the geography of Jerusalem, um, the temple uh, obviously towers over the city. The city is divided into a number of quarters. Uh, there's a poor quarter to the south. To the east of the city, there's this place that all of us Christians will know, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is outside the city walls. And according to the uh, New Testament, Jesus goes outside uh, the city walls, away from the temple enclosure. Um, he uh, goes away from where one presumes that the masses were protecting him uh, and he prays and he prays and he prays. And what we've got is a, a story of, you know, Jesus praying his heart out um, and instead of 12 legions of angels uh, coming, uh, what we have is uh, 300 Roman um, soldiers or maybe 600 Roman soldiers, whatever the particular figure is, along with temple guards and uh, they capture uh, Jesus. And um, we all know the story of uh, the two swords, uh, that two of his disciples had uh, two swords. Jesus turned around to them in the New Testament, said two will be enough, um, one presumes, because of the armies of angels. You know, why do you need more than two swords uh, when we've got uh, legions of angels uh, just about to descend on, on the Romans? So we, two swords, that's, that's fine. Uh, but uh, we have the smiting of uh, uh, the ear, Jesus rebuking his uh, disciple, putting the ear back on and uh, preaching uh, peace. Um, so something wrong uh, there, uh, in my view. Either way, we've then got the story of uh, Jesus being carted away. Um, the religious authorities say he's guilty. They take him in front of the governor, Pilate. Pilate comes over, this was my teaching, I went to a Church of England school, as a jolly reasonable uh, colonial administrator. And he sort of shrugs his shoulders. What's Jesus been, um, you know, what's he, what's he guilty of? And I think, um, um, you know, the, 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 the priests say, oh, he was preaching the end of times and um, don't pay your taxes, something along those lines. Either way, uh, Pilate goes, no, wasn't it? Wasn't it uh, that he's preaching that he's the son of God or something uh, like that? Either way, Pilate is very reasonable and basically shrugs his shoulders and says, well, I can't see, you know, that he's done anything wrong. Why don't we um, just uh, let him go? The priests insist, no, no, no. Um, this guy is a, a terrible guy. We've got to, we've got to do him. Um, Pilate reluctantly goes ahead but he's got a, a plan uh, up his sleeve uh, and that is this um, custom apparently that existed uh, amongst uh, the Jews that the Romans of course fully accepted and that is that the crowd uh, can uh, get itself a prisoner freed and so he takes uh, Jesus and a couple of um, bandits out and he says well um, I can free someone. Who do you want me to free? And in the Bible, 
uh, we got uh, something along the lines of kill Jesus, kill Jesus, um, free Barabbas. Um, well, one, I don't think that there was any such um, custom. It's a bit like, to me, uh, the idea that the Nazi occupiers of uh, Paris uh, abided by the ancient French custom of um, freeing left-wing um, uh, agitators, um, you know, uh, once every year. It just doesn't uh, ring true. Uh, but what it allows the writers of the Bible to do is to say that the Romans were unseeing. They didn't know who this guy was. They didn't know that he was the son of God. Who's guilty for the death of the son of God? It's the temple priests, but it's also the Jewish people, uh, the first blood curse. So it's the Jewish people, and they say it, don't they? Upon our children's children, uh, we are guilty. We are guilty uh, of the death of uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus is killed on, on a cross, a centurion. Uh, puts a, a spear uh, through him um, as he's hanging on the cross. Again, we have to weigh up, you know, what sort of works. It's not true, uh, but the story comes down to us uh, that Jesus cries out. His last words are, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, you know, if he knew he was the son of God, if he knew he had to suffer, if he knew that this was his fate, why is he shout out in his last moments, uh, about God betraying him, God deserting him. Uh, I would suggest that a more logical story is that he was expecting the 12 angels, that this was someone who was preaching the end of time, who was preaching to um, the Jewish masses, don't pay taxes to the Romans, overthrow uh, the Romans, but don't do it in the way that the zealots are doing it. Don't do it through guerrilla struggles rely on your faith, rely on the sort of battle plan that we can read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, that sort of uh, uh, type um, um, uh, version of liberation. Now, you, you might say you would have to be crazy to believe uh, in such a, um, uh, a manner of liberation. I would say you also have to be desperate. So I'd suggest that people were desperate to believe uh, they were suffering under terrible oppression. They knew it, but they didn't think they had any other way uh, out of it other than relying on uh, a miracle. Okay. So that's the end of Jesus. Of course, as he dies, there are earthquakes. Uh, the temple um, curtain uh, it rents in uh, two. The first one I've already said to recognize him, foreigner to recognize him um, as the son of God is a Roman um, centurion. Um, okay, what I wanted to do is just wrap things up in the next couple of minutes, simply with this. Uh, that if we, as a throwaway, said that uh, Jesus died somewhere around the middle of the 30s, what we've got, roughly speaking, 30 years later, very roughly, is uh, the Jewish revolution that's described by Josephus. Uh, this is a time when Nero has been forced to commit suicide, where you've had, um, you had four Roman emperors in a row. Rome was uh, unstable. Um, Jewish people take it as their opportunity to rise up. They're surprisingly successful. Uh, they nearly take down an entire legion which has come into Jerusalem and is then retreating. It appears to be a miracle. Um, the Romans then send reinforcements um, into Judea. And amongst the commanders uh, of uh, the Jewish people uh, is one Josephus. He's a general who's put in charge of resistance in um, uh, Galilee. Um, he has big conflicts with the zealots. Uh, they fall out. Josephus defects. He, he, he betrays the, his Jewish um, um, co-religionists, joins the Roman side. He describes himself as standing outside uh, Jerusalem and uh, urging people to surrender. He's met with insults and one presumes uh, mucky stuff. Um, the 
occupiers of Jerusalem uh, refuse to surrender. Uh, the people occupying uh, Jerusalem are led by various factions of the zealots. It takes the Romans four years uh, to um, overcome uh, the Jewish uh, resistance. Uh, they sack uh, the temple. What doesn't happen is that um, uh, the Jewish population is deported. Uh, no doubt there were war captives, no doubt people were sold off into slavery in Egypt and all the rest of it, but no, uh, this is not the beginning of the exile of the Jewish people. Vast, vast, 99.9% .9 of people stayed where they were. But what we do get in this period is the birth of what the Romans started to call the Christ Christianity. And Christianity was not led by the followers of Jesus or the followers of Paul, but a breakaway from the followers of uh, James, uh, one what we know now as Paul. And uh, the earliest documents that we have in the New Testament are written by Paul. Uh, and Paul talks about him visiting James, the brother of Jesus. Paul talks about the sort of community that they built up in Jerusalem. And Paul is in charge of recruiting foreigners. And what Paul does is lessen the Jewish side um, uh, of the religion, upgrade the Greek Roman side of it. And his followers are responsible uh, for purging the religion of its overtly revolutionary elements. Some elements of that remain. So interestingly, the Bible I've got on my bookshelf um, includes a um, um, document of um, James, which is one of the best documents in the New Testament, because it tells rich people, you will go to hell if you don't give away all your wealth. You will suffer, you will cry. The Bible also contains the other version of the meek will inherit the world. We have the, the other version is it, the poor will inherit the earth. So the Bible, in my view, is a human uh, document. It's the product of struggle. It's the product of endless um, editings. Um, but the modern Christian religion is actually founded at the time of uh, Constantine, not that he was a Christian until his deathbed. And this is when you get the final version of the Bible that's still disputed uh, over. Uh, but this is the final version that comes down to us in terms of mainstream religion. Other books are excluded. Uh, my Victorian writers tell me because they are nothing like the literary power and the spirituality of the other versions. It's clearly not true. The other versions tell a different story when it comes to details. There is, they're equally mythological and fantastic, uh, but they tell a different story. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay.